Welcome to today's Campaign Legal Center conversation, Dismantling Barriers to Youth Civic Engagement. I'm Paul Smith, Senior Vice President at CLC, and thank you all for joining us. CLC is a national nonpartisan organization that works to advance democracy through law at the federal, state, and local levels. We fight for every American's right to participate in the de democratic process, and we believe our democracy should be transparent, accountable, and inclusive. Now, the ratification of the 26th Amendment in 1971 affirmed the right of all adults over 18 to participate in the democratic process. Yet, since that time, young voters have had to contend with often intentional barriers to exercising their freedom to vote, a trend per often perpetrated by anti-democracy activists. Young adults have as much stake in the democratic process as any other group. Indeed, they're the generation that will live for the longest with the consequences of what our elected officials do. They deserve a real voice in shaping their future. Today, we'll discuss the unique barriers facing young voters highlight the attempts to exclude uh, these voters from our elections, and finally discuss solutions to facilitate participation of young voters in our democracy. But before we start our discussion, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. Uh, during the conversation, please use the comment section on Facebook or YouTube to submit your questions for members of the panel. At the end of the panel, we'll, we'll start the Q&A section and we'll do our best to get to every question that gets asked, but because of time, we may not be able to do that. We may not be able to answer every question. If we're not able to answer your question today and you're a member of the press, please email uh, questions to media at campaignlegalcenter.org. Uh, if you're a member of the public and we're not able to answer your question, please email info at campaignlegalcenter.org. Now let me introduce today's panel. First, we have Bianca Rosales, uh, Associate Director of Partnerships at the Students Learn, Students Vote Coalition. Bianca is an experienced activist and community organizer. She served as the Director of Community Engagement in San Antonio, Texas, and worked as in Washington, D.C., advocating for reproductive rights. Bianca is currently pursuing her Master's in Public Administration at NYU and holds a B.S. in Communication Studies at uh, from the University of Texas at Austin. She also serves on the board of directors for the National Latina Institute for Reproductive Justice. Uh, welcome, Bianca. Uh, next is Kyle Nitschke. Uh, he is co-executive director for the Arizona Students Association. Born and raised in Arizona and a product of the public schools there, Kyle is, as I said, co-executive director of the nonprofit Arizona Students Association. Uh, he's actively involved in his community and a student voting rights advocate. Kyle's been involved in youth voter registration work since 2016 and registered thousands of students to vote. Welcome, Kyle. Next up is Laura Brill, CEO and founder of the Civic Center. Laura is an attorney and former law clerk to Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She's an award-winning advocate for, with more than two decades of experience working on complex legal issues and advocating for the LGBTQ plus community and for equal voting rights. Uh, she launched the Civic Center in 2018 to stop youth voter suppression and to tackle the decades old problem of low youth turnout. Welcome, Laura. And finally, we welcome Valencia Richardson, Legal Counsel for Voting Rights at Campaign Legal Center, where she works to protect and th strengthen the freedom to vote. Uh, before law school, Valencia was a Fulbright grantee and a student voting rights organizer for the Andrew Goodman Foundation, for which she served as a board member. She's the author of a nonfiction book, Young and Disaffected, and published Voting While Poor, Reviving the 24th Amendment, and Eliminating the Modern Day Poll Tax, in the Georgetown Journal on Poverty Law and Policy. Thanks to the panel members for joining us today as we discuss youth voter engagement. So let's get started. Uh, starting with you, Laura, let me uh, ask you this question and maybe others want to weigh in as well. We know that young people tend to turn out at much lower rates than other age groups. 
What do you think that is, Laura? Are you are there structural reasons why uh, for this there's this discrepancy? In your Yes, thank you. It's so great to be with all of you. And thank you to, to Paul and to Campaign Legal Center for um, getting us all together on this on this topic. What I always tell people about youth turnout is to remember that turnout is a function of two separate processes, registration and casting a ballot. And when young people know, are registered and they know the stakes, they actually turn out at very high rates. So in, in 2020, for example, 86% of registered youth turned out. And when we see these low numbers of turnout, it's intimately tied with low levels of registration and low levels of um, coordinated, funded, um, efforts to help young people understand how government works, how they can have an impact and to and to give them the motivation and understanding to register in the first place and then um, and then turn out. So as of as of the midterms, only 30 percent of 18 of, of 18 year olds were registered. So 30%, that's just a shockingly low, um, low rate. And so registration programs, I would say, are one of the keys to, uh, to improving, improving turnout. And, and many, um, we focus on high schools um, at the Civic Center and high schools are a great place to focus because about, they're the most equitable way to get young people registered because about 40% don't go on to college, and in high school you can you can work with everybody. Um, uh, and college, not to uh, college programs are also super important, especially given the lack of uh, you know what the lack of uh, work going on in high school. So we see biggest problems you know focused on just the youngest voters. Very short windows in some states before young people um, uh, turn eighteen, in which they can in which they can register. Uh, some states have early deadlines before elections, and so people are just waking up to the fact that there's going to be an election and the registration deadline's already passed. Um, as I said, lack of implementation in high schools and also in colleges. Um, some states don't have online voter registration, uh, which is a big inhibitor. So those are, those are some of the top ones that we, um, uh, that we focus on. Great. Well, then maybe let's turn to the college uh, setting. Uh, with Bianca. Bianca, the, the, the Students Learn, Student Votes Coalition <clears throat> works tirelessly to engage voters on college campuses across the country. Can you talk a bit about the barriers to voting that you see on college campuses? Have those uh, barriers worsened in recent years? Yes, thank you so much, Paul, for the question and for having me here. I'm um, really honored to be among such um, incredible leaders in this space. Um, but yeah, that's a really important question and thank you for asking it. Um, I want to start off with the impact of voter ID laws. Um, this specifically is pretty front of mind for me um, because there's a recent public survey that was done by vote writers, um, PublicWise, the Center for Democracy and Civic Engagement at the University of Maryland and the Brennan Center for Justice um, that focus on the possession of various types of government issued photo IDs and the obstacles that folks face when trying to acquire them. It's actually the first comprehensive public survey in nearly two decades. So it's a pretty big deal, as you can imagine. Um, so I highly recommend checking it out. But one of the things that I wanted to highlight um, here um, that stood out to me as particularly alarming is that when it comes to voter ID laws, it turns out that uh, the youngest voters are really the ones that are feeling the greatest impact. Um, in fact, the, the University of Maryland and vote writers did an analysis of this survey um, and according to this analysis, it's hitting them pretty hard. In fact, out of around 11.5 million folks that are aged 18 to 29 who don't have a driver's license, set, that's already a large number. 7.5 million of those folks are between 18 and 24 years old. So that's a huge chunk um, that of young people that don't have driver's license, right? And get this, among 18 to 19 year olds, more than 15% reporting reported having zero photo ID of any kind. So that's a big deal because there's way they're way more likely to lack ID compared to older folks. I'm talking like 3.7 times more likely than 20 to 24 year olds and six times more likely than people over 30. So even though the 26th amendment to the constitution says that age should not be a barrier to voting, 
these voter ID laws are hitting the youngest voters the hardest. It's like they're facing an extra hurdle just because they're new um, to the voting game. And unfortunately, since June of 2023, we have seen an uptick of these voter ID laws across the country. In total, 38 states now have implemented voter ID laws with 23 requiring photo ID to vote and 10 mandating specific forms of photo ID. That trend has made it increasingly challenging for students, particularly as fewer of them possess driver's license, like I mentioned. But that's not all. Um, students often have to navigate residency and address issues because many college students live away from their permanent addresses while attending school. And they're often moving from dorms, apartments, or campuses sometimes every single year, at least that was my situation. And that could really lead to confusion about voter registration, especially if their school address differs from their home address on official documents. That's a really tricky thing to navigate. And sometimes that means that they choose not to engage altogether. So, but let's say they are, they successfully navigate those obstacles and they register to vote. Then you have the issue of lack of accessibility of polling locations. I mentioned earlier, college students don't have access to a driver's license, much less a vehicle to get them from place to place. With busy school schedules and lack of transportation, it's extremely difficult for students to prioritize and go out of their way to vote, even though they care deeply about what happens in our democracy. And we know that's true. So with all of these obstacles and confusing laws, it's so important that college campuses and community organizations, like many on this call and probably that are listening right now, um, support students by providing voter education programming to equip young people with the knowledge and confidence that they need to cast their ballot. Thank you for that. That's great. Um, maybe then we'll uh, turn to Kyle's work in this in this area as well. Kyle, you, you've been on the ground in Arizona working with students and legislators to empower students to vote. Can you talk about some of the unique challenges you've seen in that work? What, what is it like for students on the ground doing this work? Yeah, of course, Paul, and thank you so much for having me. And I think Bianca spoke really clearly to some of the issues that college students face. Here in Arizona, uh, we have a law that was passed about 10 to 15 years ago that creates a dual track registration system for our students. So when they're registering to vote without the Arizona driver's license, which Bianca spoke to, many of our students haven't taken the time to get their new driver's license. You know, they're only gonna be there for a year if they're at the dorm, so they don't wanna necessarily spend the money. And that's why Vote Riders has been really awesome. Um, but in Arizona, when our students register to vote without an Arizona state ID, they get put in the federal only voter registration system. And then they have to follow up with a copy of their birth certificate or a picture of their passport to be able to fully register for our state and local elections here in Arizona. Um, this makes it really difficult for, oh, no, sorry. What I wanted to say about that was the federal only system, we've, we got a really great report out in fall of last year. Jen Fifield does some really great work with vote something about beat, I'm not sure. Um, but we saw all of these federal only voters are really highlighted, uh, con sorry, concentrated around our college campuses, at ASU, U of A and NAU, also along the border. And then uh, around some of the homeless shelters is where we saw really high precincts of high federal only voters. Um, so that's, you know, a law that has really been impactful for our students as far as getting them registered locally and voting where they're going to school. And then, just things that impact us getting those students registered and out to vote is um, really our universities need to do a lot more to institutionalize voter registration and getting out the vote when our students are coming onto campus. So as they're moving into their dorms, there should be a voter registration ask at the beginning of that. Um, you know, I think we've really tried to supplement some of the universities and institutions lack of voter registration and um, get out the vote work through some of these large nonprofits that'll come in and, and try to do this work. And then really we see with our students is that they cannot do this work for free. And um, we have to we have to pay them if we want them to be effective and really want to make sure that we're registering. Registering if we want to. Yes. All right. Thank um, you. Obviously, Arizona has its own level of complexity with this federal only um, registration separate process from the main one. It's really quite quite something. Um, Valencia. Uh, why don't you take a step back and, and contextualize all of this? Uh, and these attacks on young voters, um, are there are they new or part of a broader trend? Or are there any trends within the attacks on student voting that you want to highlight? Tell us uh, what, what your experience is. Hi, well, hi, Paul, and hi, everybody else. Uh, <laughs> um, so I think it's just important to take a step back uh, and understand sort of what the struggle for youth voting 
rights have been just going all the way back to the enactment of the 26th Amendment and the and the lead up to the act, enactment of the 26th Amendment way back in 1971. And so uh, there's definitely a through line. Um, it's really, I think a lot of people don't realize that the enactment of the 26th Amendment was um, a part of the larger civil rights movement at the tail end of the 1960, the civil rights movement in the 1960s. We get um, youth voting, uh, youth organizers who were part of that movement um, now protesting the war in Vietnam and other things that were happening in this um, late 60s and early 70s and wanting to and uh, and wanting to allow 18 year olds to vote. Um, before that, it was very disparate. Some states uh, let you vote when you're 18, some but when you were uh, 21. And um, so there was a national youth movement to lower the national voting age um, to 18. And that led to the enactment of the 26th Amendment in 1971. Um, and, I, and so the struggle for youth voting rights goes all the way back. And it is, it's like alongside the fight for civil rights writ large and voting rights writ large for people, for marginalized people in this country. Um, and so it's uh, those so sort of like that history, tra tracking it along today, we see sort of sustained efforts to make it harder to register to vote, which always is going to impact um, young voters, so 18 to 24-year-olds who are less likely to have um, a driver's license, less la likely to have other types of, like a pa even a passport, other types of identification that would allow them to register to vote and vote. Um, onerous, uh, 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 Bianca is saying polling places is huge. That's no on the head. Um, uh, inadequate polling places um, is a huge problem, particularly where, uh, and has been even litigated uh, as, as recently as um, a few years ago in um, Texas, uh, in HBCU in South Texas, uh, uh, moved a polling, uh, an early voting location away from the college campus. And so um, that's certainly uh, an issue, and the fact that it's an HBCU was not, is not is certainly not a coincidence. Um, and so, um, the um, uh, even like the restrictions on um, voter registration and absentee ballot application assistance, which CLC litigates pretty heavily, um, has a direct impact on students because young people are going to be the direct beneficiaries of any third party assistance that is uh, provided because of all of those barriers that both Kyle and Bianca in particular have highlighted about how, you know, the, the mobility of, of, of college students and young people in general, not just college students, um, and the uh, lack of identification and the um, just general barriers, um, those are going to be mitigated by third party assistance. So restrictions on third party assistance are going to have a ripple effect on uh, uh, young people writ large. Um, and so when we see those types of barriers, this is all just a part of a long um, struggle, unfortunately, to um, allow 18 to 24 year olds to participate in our democracy. Thank you, Valencia. Um, we've talked a lot about the barriers. Now, what maybe we should uh, talk a little bit in the, in the time we have here about some of the solutions that these experts see. Uh, turning back to, to you, Laura, um, you've, uh, you, you've noted the difficulties of getting people registered and all the problems there. Uh, can you take us through some of the policies you support that would improve voter turnout uh, and talk, talk about how successful they've been? Yeah, sure. Can I? Um, it looked like Bianca maybe had something to say that she popped up while Valencia was talking. So I just wanted to see if she wanted to well, jump in first. And then, sure. And then, yeah. Oh, sure. Sorry. <laughs> um, well, no, actually, I wanted to share a fun fact. Um, Kai was talking about the incredible work that um, they're doing in Arizona. And um, I wanted to share a fun fact about one of our partners in Arizona, um, Mesa Community College. They're a Hispanic serving two-year public institution in Maricopa County. Uh, they created a groundbreaking student voter registration strategy that trains professors to incorporate the student voter registration process into the classroom. Um, SOSV worked with them to develop this strategy and create resources to help other schools follow Mesa Community College's model. And many have, including the University of Pennsylvania. So it's really cool because you have this 
an incredible two-year community college in Arizona that is the model for a world-renowned Ivy League institution student voter registration efforts. And I just think that that speaks to all of the work that is happening in Arizona and in a lot of places all across the country. And I just wanted to highlight that because some really great stuff is happening. It's also really important to highlight like the community colleges, uh, not just for your universities as well. In that yeah, environment. absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And right. they're like doing the work, so it's really great. Actually, this is, it's such a perfect point just to, because Paul, you were asking about, about um, some solutions and what we're doing in high schools, it's one of the programs, one, one of the things we really focus on is student-led adult supported drives. And what that means is we don't, we want the students to really be involved, to be talking to one another and to explaining to their peers why voter registration matters and why voting matters, but they shouldn't be doing it alone. And so we have created what we call an educator forum where we train educators and we provide a stipend for to make it possible for educators to do this and how to weave voter registration and voting, voting rights into their curriculum. And we've seen just incredible interest in, um, uh, in Wisconsin, in, in Pennsylvania, in Southern California. We've done it in all of these places. We're about to do something very similar in Michigan. Um, and it's, it's a, you know, a lot of people don't, it, it's one of the issues in voting rights where everybody can actually help because the problems are so, you know, are so vast and where um, a little bit of just like community education and, and support can go a long way. And, you know, one thing that most people don't realize and that I only found out about a couple of months ago actually was motor voter, right? Which is where we have voter uh, drivers, um, DMVs, departments of motor vehicles are required voter registration agencies in most states under the National Voting Rights Act. Originally, as that act was, um, was proposed, um, high schools <laughs> were also required voter registration agencies. So if that had passed in the 90s, instead of having this kind of weird system where driving becomes the key to whether you can vote or not, just going to school and being involved at a high school could have been the key. And we could be in a, you know, in a very different um, place today. So, you know, the main interventions, because we're working with, with high school students, the main interventions we focus on are getting states to pass pre-registration laws. These are laws that allow young people to pre-register as soon as they're 16. And we now have about half of US teens live in states where they can pre-register when they're 16, which is a huge opportunity. And just, just last year, three new states came online, Michigan, Minnesota, and Illinois. And so this is a growing trend. It's, it's, um, blue states have it, red states have it, purple states have it, and and uh, there's a Youth Voting Rights Act that's before Congress um, uh, that would also um, in include it, as would as would for the For the People Act. So you know it's possible. It it would have a transformative effect because it gives it would give a decent two year window for high school students when they're in an educational setting to just get registered and and be talking to another and start identifying um, as as voters and I think the the ID laws that um, uh, that you know that Bianca and Kyle were both talking about those you know those are um, really huge impediments and. Um, you know, one of the things just to be to watch out for is that sometimes uh, the laws, when they require, let's say they require a student ID to be acceptable ID, it might say an unexpired student ID, which actually for high school students, that means it doesn't work <laughs> because they they might be expired in June and you want to vote in November. So um, so. Some or they might not have an expiration date, even, you know. Right, right. So some of these de some of these implementation issues we can talk at the you know at the big level, and then sometimes it comes down to right how is it being implemented? If, if you're at the DMV, where's the opt out uh, that um, you know the opt out, and is the opt out being pro provided in a way that is actually encouraging people not to <laughs> register, you know, instead of the opposite. 
Kyle, well, I think you had a point you wanted to jump in. Another example out of Arizona, which seems to be a focus of attention today. <laughs> well, first, another note I got reminded about this: the student voting IDs is legislation we're trying to work on, and the you know expiration dates was one thing. But now we're finding out so many of our students are using digital voter IDs instead of physical IDs, and so working that into the legislation we're working on and for for the twenty twenty five session. Yeah. The other bit I wanted to highlight is just how useful same day automatic voter registration would be in conjunction with that. At NAU in 2022 at our giant voting center where they can vote from all over the county, we had over 300 students have to cast provisional ballots because they either weren't registered, they were registered in another county. So same day automatic voter registration paired up with student voting ID laws could really stop some of that disenfranchisement. Great. Uh, Bianca, um, we've seen government action like this uh, student voter toolkit released by the Department of Education this year aiming to help young voters. Um, that raises a good question. What can people do, uh, both those who are in positions in power and those who are just ordinary citizens, do right now to help more young people vote? Yeah, absolutely, Paul. And if I can, um, I'd also love to share a few examples in um, Maryland, California, and Minnesota about some of the laws that they are that they have passed that we're seeing a lot of success with. Um, in fact, um, like I said, California, Maryland, Minnesota, they have enacted laws that require universities in their states to designate a student vote coordinator and submit what we call nonpartisan democratic engagement action plans. Um, basically a roadmap of how they're going to turn out the vote on their campus. Um, and so in the last presidential election cycle, colleges and universities that created these nonpartisan democratic engagement action plans achieved voting rates nearly four percentage points higher than institutions that did an action plan. So, so yeah, so there's also a strong and growing evidence that campuses that create um, better action plans, they achieve higher voting rates each election cycle that they complete a new action plan. And that makes sense, right? If you think about it, campuses that have um, worked for years to institutionalize voting as part of the student experience, they tend to succeed more and more over time. So I like to highlight that because I think if more states like California, Maryland, and Minnesota, um, if they could follow those states, it could potentially help thousands of thousands of students cast their ballots for the first time. Um, so just wanted to share that. But to answer your point, Paul, which is a great question, and I also want to thank you for bringing up the Student Voter Toolkit. Um, it's definitely a step in the right direction. Um, and fun fact there. A lot of the campuses featured in the toolkit are ones we work with directly. So it was like really awesome to see their efforts recognized as examples of what other campuses can do too. But let's get real here. Many people don't realize this, but colleges are actually legally required to make an effort to help students register to vote. Yeah, it's part of the Higher Education Act. The problem is many, if not most, campuses are strapped for resources. Oftentimes, that means that they have just one person to handle all things civic engagement on top of their regular duties. It's a lot to ask, right? So here's the deal. We can't expect students to navigate this on their own, and campuses need a hand too. And that's where we come in. So my call to action is simple. If you're a nonprofit working in civic engagement, especially if you're a local nonprofit, um, join the student vote movement. We have the know-how and the tools to help you make a difference on college campuses, even if this area is not your expertise. So I really want to encourage folks to join and let's team up so that we can make voting a lifestyle for the next generation. And if you're a student out there, um, for those that are listening that are students or young people, you're not alone in this. You've got a whole community that's rallying behind you. It's truly so easy. Um, to be disillusioned by politics, especially in the face of the constant marriage of the national news cycle. But there are so many wonderful things happening at a local level. So I encourage you to get involved directly in your community. Um, one specific way that um, folks can get can do that is getting involved with their local elections office as a volunteer, as an intern, or as a full-on career. It's a great way to start. More than half of all election workers are over 60 years old. And since 2020, these offices have been under enormous stress. And they've always faced unique challenges when it comes to working with campus communities specifically. So think about it. Both of those issues can be alleviated when college campuses and local election officials work together. Local election offices receive the support they need from younger members of the workforce who understand the needs of student voters and are often more times more tech savvy. Um, and campus communities are, in turn, served by a local elections office that has stronger connection with them and resources 
to give to support their student vote efforts. So that would be my, um, my advice. But yeah, so importantly, the Department of Education, I also want to highlight, we talked about this earlier, I forgot who mentioned this, that um, uh, we need to pay students to do this work, right? And um, so that kind of reminded me, the Department of Education released guidance earlier this year that explicitly stated that institutions can use federal work study funds to pay students to work at their local elections office or to engage in nonpartisan democratic engagement work. So any federal work study eligible students should consider doing this. But regardless of how you choose to engage, we need you. Your leadership and perspective as students and as young people is what fuels our movement. And we can't do this without you. So get involved, speak up, make your voices heard. And remember, voting isn't just a one-time thing or on um, presidential election years. It's a habit. It's a way of life. And so I encourage everyone to um, let's work together to make sure that every young person has the support and resources they need to be active participants in our democracy, because together and only together is the way that we can make a real difference. I'm sure others, maybe you, Laura, have, have some other ideas of how people can, including just the, the average person watching us today, can get involved and get people voting. Uh, yes, absolutely. So, so thank you. And, and you know, one one of the things, uh, Bianca, you said so so much in that, but one of the things that I was um, uh, was really resonating was the the campus planning, right? Figuring out what you're going to do and then doing it. And and for high schools, it's actually kind of remarkable. There are many states that require something similar in high schools, that they must have a person who's responsible for voter registration, or they, they must teach it in their curriculum. And what we see is um, a lot of very positive laws like this, and then massive non-compliance <laughs> with the laws, and and virtually no enforcement on the on the state level, and and often do not. Sometimes it's due to uh, intentional, uh, you know, desires to suppress. But a lot of times it's it's resources, or it's not even knowing that the laws are are there. And so, you know, I mean, one example: Texas has requires high schools to have deputy voter registrars and to register all their students. And the Texas Texas Civil Rights Project did a really great report a couple years ago on it's just very few are complying and and we live in i live in california and um and california it's actually the same situation we have laws requiring high schools to designate a person responsible for uh distributing voter registration forms and for uh do for helping students to register and almost everywhere it's it's not happening and especially in under-resourced schools so uh schools in in communities where they have uh, you know, very robust civics education. Um, uh, there can be just, you know, 50 percentage point differences between schools that are, that are, have just decided to do this work and schools that don't have the resources and, and the training. And so, you know, coming back to, um, you know, the question, Paul, you asked about what can people do? I, I think becoming aware of these obstacles that are um, that are youth specific, and they they also have just you know very disparate impacts in terms of under resourced communities being harder hit. So there's a real intersectional component of this, and learning about it, learn and and asking asking the institutions that you're already involved in what they're doing, and and helping them point to resources to do better. And so. We have at, at the other another program I just want to highlight of the Civic Center is called Cap, Gown, and Ballot. And that's the idea that for high schools, graduation should be a really strong focused time to get all the seniors. There's about four million of them who are about to graduate in May and June and getting them all registered to vote. So anybody listening to this call can, if you're involved in a your school community, call the principal, call the social studies teacher, the director of, of curriculum, talk to student leaders themselves and help them realize that almost all of them, even in, even in the states that have the narrowest windows for um, submitting voter registration forms, almost all of them are old enough to register before they graduate from, uh, from high school. So taking it on yourself to be an ambassador we have a lot of model, we have like model emails that you can just send yourself. You don't need anybody's permission and they're they're on our website. And, and so that, you know, that, that concept of community involvement in getting in getting students to understand their own 
power, what the obstacles are and how, you know, how they can overcome them is a, is a real contribution. That's great. Thank you. I'm sure a lot of people want to hear about that. Um, Kyle, let, let's talk about uh, this from a slightly different point of view. Um, as we head deeper into what's surely going to be an intense election year, that's for sure. Uh, it's important to acknowledge that at times, helping students vote in the face of immense barriers can be kind of de demoralizing. Uh, what gives you hope and keeps you going uh, as, you, as you do this work? And I want to hear others after we hear from Kyle about what keeps you all going, if we have time. Yeah, great question, Paul. For me, it's just the students I work with. They're so engaged and passionate about not necessarily voting, but about the issues that come with, with the right to vote. And then the encouraging piece I want to leave folks with is that students are voting at the highest rate we've seen in, in 20 to 30 years. I mean, students really do want to vote and get out there. It's just about dismantling the rest of these really awful laws and giving them the opportunity to do so. Others want to jump in? Yeah, I'll jump in quickly. Um, I think I was going to mostly say the same thing as Kyle. I think that with respect to student and youth voting in particular, I think you really could look at like the significant turnout uh, jump in the last uh, several election cycles as, as reason to hope and as reason to um, uh, have like, as reason to know that there's like momentum around this movement that at least I, I started doing this work as a college student myself. It's why I became a voting rights lawyer and the momentum since on the voting rights movement in the last decade has just really um, has, has really taken off, particularly since the 2018 election, when we saw like record increase for a uh, record turnout for uh, voters 18 to 24 that led to an entire shift in the composition of Congress. Um, and, and ever since then, we've just seen slowly that momentum building. Um, I do think also to leave us with hope, um, uh, Bianca mentioned the Higher Education Act's um, requirement that uh, all student, all colleges and universities covered by the act provide voter registration assistance. Um, and that is a part of the law that has been incredibly under enforced in the last several, uh, since it, <laughs> in, over the last several decades. And uh, the fact that the Department of Education put out that toolkit, um, which CLC helped push, um, also shows sort of a prioritization of student voting um, in, at, at the federal level within um, within federal government that we haven't seen before. So these are all new efforts. Uh, yeah, the Department of Ed has like, you know, they sent out a couple letters here and there. This is the first time, at least that I've seen, uh, that they actually put out substantive, here's how you can comply with a, a higher um, education acts requirements. Um, that actually provides real guidance to colleges and universities that just didn't occur before. And so that's another reason to hope, though, because we should, we're seeing sort of like efforts going forward and we're seeing it match with like this historic turnout. Um, 2020's turnout for uh, young voters was huge, uh, uh, reached 50 percent, and it hasn't reached 50 percent in a presidential and uh, and many presidential election cycles, but it did in <laughs> it did in 2020, and so and we can see sort of uh, that causing um, both advocates and governments to sort of prioritize youth voters finally for the first time since the uh, 26th Amendment's enactment. Bianca, Laura, what what keeps you going in the face of the the, the challenges we we've been talking about? Um, I, I'll go, I, you know, a lot of things, principally the students um, and the educators. And so, you know, we, and, and seeing them bring uh, democracy to life for themselves. So, so we've done recently in California, there was a training we did and we have a little video, but the, the student who ran a voter registration drive, she says in this, in this video, I didn't even know you had to register. I think, of course, everybody should register. She went on and, and registered, you know, a couple hundred kids at her high school from not even not knowing. And and the the drive and the, you know, the willingness of people to say yes to this is, um, you know, I think that's that's one of the things that really, um, you know, that really keeps me keeps me going. And um, uh, yeah. 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 Um, 
And I would just say, honestly, not much different than what folks on this call. I want to echo everything that folks said. Um, but yeah, it's really honing in on like getting to engage with like young people. Um, in my role, I normally work with nonprofit representatives. But um, last year, we had the National Student Vote Summit at the University of Maryland in College Park. And we had over 240 folks all across the country that joined us. Over 100 of those were students. And they were so brave and they're so resilient and they're so talented and they were coming up and they were sharing fantastic ideas about things that they want to do and what they are, the problems that they're seeing. But beyond that, the solutions that we can engage with to, to um, you know, for a better democracy, for a more inclusive, more equitable democracy. And so it was really beautiful. I remember walking away and being like, I don't think I was like this when I was in college. <laughs> like, I'm so, I was so inspired. I like these, they're just unreal. They're incredible. And that's what gives me hope is like those opportunities that I get to engage directly with them. It's seriously so inspiring um, when you see them standing up for what they believe in. Um, so yeah, it's all about students. We're not just fighting um, for them. We're fighting alongside them. And I think that's really important to remember. That's great. Um, I'm wondering at this point if our team has some questions to pop up that we can pose to the uh, from from the audience. Thank you very much, Emma. Um, so, question: uh, Last year, a couple of towns in Vermont and Maryland actually moved to lower the voting age in local elections to 16, and just this year, Newark allowed 16 to 17 year olds to vote in local school board elections. Can you take us through the benefits of lowering the voting age to 16s and, and possibly touch on the history? Of these efforts, does anybody have some knowledge they want to bring bring forth about the actual lowering the voting age as a as a possible inducement to get people involved? Sure, I think we're seeing sort of like in the last few years a similar movement that we saw in the seventies to lower the voting age from twenty one to eighteen to lowering it for, uh, to in state and local elections and local elections in particular. Um, uh, from 18 to 16. Um, and so you've got like those states that were mentioned in the question, but also um, the District of Columbia has uh, proposed that as well for local elections. Um, and then several counties and several states have proposed that. And I think there's just um, a recognition like um, Laura has mentioned. And I think, and actually all of the panelists have mentioned that um, when you start voting young, you develop a pattern and a habit of voting and it becomes a part of your routine and then you're more likely to vote for the rest of your life. And so, um, and the idea of 16 year olds voting, particularly in uh, local elections, um, it, it, I think it, it relates to the idea that local elections uh, affect individual citizens on that daily day basis the most, more than any other level of government. And so getting um, 16 year olds involved in that process in order to sort of um, have uh, a stake in their government. Uh, that's, you know, those are the governments that are uh, local elections are the elections that are funding their high schools and funding uh, and, and funding all of those, uh, like the things that they care about on a day to day basis. And uh, it's just the first step that to get to get young folks engaged. That's really interesting, Valencia. Yeah. Um, others want to comment on that or we can take another question. Yeah, I, I, I would just say so. So I think a lot of it also with the energy behind this um, effort also comes internationally from climate um, organizations who are saying who is going to be most impacted by climate change and it's it's young people and and um uh, you know the, the the additional point that we also just really like to drive um home is that in a lot of respects you know we we already we do have the ability to vote nationally at 18 and the huge the just lack of implementation of the existing laws that we already have and and drawing um, real focus to let's let's also use the laws we already already have and make sure we understand sort of where the um, uh, where we can make a difference um, you know today. That sounds like a really good advice as well, Laura. Thanks. Uh, is there another question? One thing that's gotten a lot of attention recently are younger candidates running for office. That's certainly the case. What barriers do younger candidates face, and what solutions might help them overcome? Any of those barriers? 
I would love to take this one. The Arizona Student Association does a really great job of running a lot of our students for office. We've had several of our students become school board members. Our recent co-executive director just got elected to the State House of Representatives. Our current Northern Regional Director is running for State Senate in Legislative District 7. And the way she is able to really balance everything is through the clean elections process that we have here in Arizona. So here, uh, candidates are able to collect $205 contributions from voters within their district, and the state will actually give them about fifty dollars or $60,000 to run their campaign. So that allows Haley and young candidates to really focus their time and energy on talking to young voters, talking to the people that they need to get out to vote, and not worry about doing all the fundraising. I'd say the other huge barrier is just being able to balance running a campaign with either going to school or working full time. You know, the challenges that any working class candidate uh, faces uh, running for election. Um, thanks so much. <laughs> That's great, though. The, the, the public financing can be such an enormously important factor in people's ability to do that, especially a first race like that. It's terrific. Others have a comment on that question, or we can see if there's another one. Let's pop another one up. What challenges do youth face in accessing reliable information about the political process and how can we overcome them? There's a question I know you all have an answer to. Who wants to go first? I can start. I was gonna say no one's, if no one's gonna go. I think uh, particularly in the last, since the last election uh, and we've entered sort of this era of misinformation and disinformation, I think even before that, um, there was an issue with receiving political information because, frankly, no one was looking at youth voters as a pri uh, as a primary constituency to to collect votes from. And so, the because there was no effort toward young voters, there was no information going towards them either, either both on like a partisan level and a nonpartisan level. There just wasn't a focus um, on uh, towards providing young voters with information. And so the um, uh, the consequences that young voters have uh, disparate problems uh, obtaining information. And then that's only worsened since 2020 when we've seen like the proliferation of misinformation and disinformation. And I think those it's a pretty, um, and not to sound old, but I think social media also uh, <laughs> proliferates that where uh, most young people um, in 2024 are receiving their information from TikTok, from other platforms, and the proliferation of misinformation on those platforms only makes uh, uh, only increases the problem. And there, as particularly when there's not good information coming from the other side, which would be like their universities, their like the places where they can rely on. And that's Sorry, why those, like, the, the AS, difficulty. I'm sorry, Melissa. Yeah, I, didn't mean I was just going to say the work of the other the organizations on this panel is just so important for that reason alone. Yes, is that there there has to be sort of like someone <laughs> giving someone the right information. If uh, um, and that's what the work of uh, all of these organizations yeah. do. Well, my, my guess is Laura can help us yeah. find learn about a little bit about. I mean, how much people are coming out of high school with knowledge of civics and stuff. Days. Yeah, I mean, I mean, civ civics education has just been dramatically cut in so many places. And many times when there is an effort to improve civics education, it's very, uh, you know, it's like, let's give everybody the citizenship exam and which does not teach you how you can make a difference in your in your world. And so, you know, restoring real civics education is I think should be on everybody's to-do list as, as part of, you know, strengthening our democracy. And, and there's, you know, there's misinformation. There, there's also just a relentless, you know, on, on social media and, and elsewhere, this pervasive concept targeted at young people. You can't make a difference. It doesn't matter. You don't care. And a lot of people just absorb that, you know, and they, and, and turn off. And so there's a big, um, the thing that overcomes that is trusted relationships, friends, parents, educators who who can say with authority and with you know love, it does matter. You do matter. You can make you know you can make a difference. Um, you know, and I, I think one of the things that just to pick up on something Valencia said that we that is can be an aha moment for for young people if you're not registered, you're not in the voter file, 
And if you're not in the voter file, you're not getting communications from candidates because especially candidates running on a low on a low budget, what are they doing? They're not crazy. They're targeting people who they think are likely voters and at least registered voters. And so, um, you know, young people themselves can do a lot to break this cycle just by making themselves visible. Uh, not that that not that voter registration solves all the problems, but it can be a real um, turning point in terms of in terms of starting the dialogue and saying yes, I want to um, be I want to be uh, receive information about who's running, what they care about, and how that why they want my vote. Yeah, and I think the only thing I would add to that is I just want to emphasize what like folks have said on this call around like especially the trusted messenger piece. I think like trusted messenger around like yes, your voice does matter, but also like trusted messengers of like folks who um, who have like um, accurate information, right? And it also like further emphasizes and and Valencia mentioned this like organizations um, in the nonpartisan space, why they're so important, um, because they're sharing information um, in a way that, um, yeah, that's like accurate, that's not based on electing a specific candidate, but is just based on the facts and the truth. And, um, and so, yeah, amid all of like how folks, you know, young people are getting disillusioned by politics, that's like even more important. Um, and it's also why it's really important that college campuses really invest um, and that nonprofits support college campuses in those efforts to invest in civic education. Um, like like Laura was saying, um, like programs like celebrating the civic holidays, right? Um, we have like incredible National Voter Registration Day, one of the, the oldest uh, civic holiday, but we also have other ones, right? National Voter Education Week, Vote Early Day, Election Hero Day, taking those opportunities um, to really celebrate and make democracy fun and celebratory is so important, especially when thinking about how we can um, create a culture of, uh, d of like democracy that like and engagement in our democracy on college campuses and, and in other spaces as well. That sounds terrific. Thank, thanks, Bianca. I guess at this point, I guess what I'd like to do is give each of our guests an opportunity to um, give us some closing thoughts, and then we'll have to wind up this really wonderful panel. But uh, uh, I'd love to hear from each of you as sort of where you where you are, what, you, what final message you'd like to give to the, the viewers. Uh, you want to start, Valencia? Yeah. I think um, uh, the more we see both in like uh, the legal advocacy space and the organizing um, advocacy space, uh, youth voting rights as uh, a part of the larger um, uh, fight for both voting rights and civil rights in this country, I think the more um, momentum we will continue to gain and um, getting youth voting rights, like this sort of uh, attention it deserves. It hasn't, it's getting more attention and, um, but it needs more investment and more attention. Um, and I, and I, I think we um, just reminding folks to see this as a part of the larger, um, the larger movement to like bring as many people into our democracy as possible. Um, every eligible voter deserves a chance to participate and that includes youth voting. And so um, uh, just reminding folks to keep youth in the conversation and keep young people in conversation. Uh, I really like that linkage, Valencia. That's, that's yeah. terrific. Um, who, who wants to go next? Uh, let's see, Kyle, you haven't spoken in a little while. Do you have a yeah. final thoughts? I I guess my ending message is that it's going to take all of us to be able to do this. It's been really great working with national partners and support of the Campaign Legal Center and Student Learn Students Votes Resources and the Civic Center getting into our high schools in Arizona. Um, but ideally, 10 years from now, you know, the Arizona Students Association, I don't want to be registering these students to vote every semester. They should be automatically registered to vote, and we should be doing the work to bring them along to the next step. And that's that's the future that I see. Yeah, looking forward to. There's a lot the law can do to, to fix the problem. That is absolutely true. Uh, Bianca? Yeah, I think my parting words are really like if there are folks like like um, local community groups, local leaders, like you all are the ones that are driving this movement. And um, coming from like a national nonpart uh, nonprofit partner, like we have our role to play, but really like our whole theory of change here is trusting our local leaders. And by that, I mean like the organizers, the ones that are on the ground that are talking to folks. Um, and getting the work done. And um, and so just like, I I always give so much praise to um, to those leaders because I feel like they don't get enough, but they're the ones that are moving us forward. Um, and it's really important to like, that, support those efforts. 
And they're the ones that have the trust of the other students, right? Have that exactly. Advantage. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Peers really matter. Uh, Laura, you go next. Um, Four million Americans turn 18 every year. And because there has been a persistent 25 percentage point gap in registration, that feeds into a turnout gap. There's an opportunity right now between now and November to literally register and turn out millions of young people who are about to graduate from high school, who are about to start college, who are continuing their college careers and who are who are not going to college and to tell them they can make a difference and to really um, uh, on a personal level, it's one of the most kind of just personally gratifying things you can do is, is help build that and make pe sure people know that it does matter if they vote. Uh, you might not love every single candidate that you're going to vote for, but there are better choices and worse choices that connect with young people and what they care about and helping them identify that for themselves, what they care about, what will determine their future and how that connects to democracy. It really is so important. There's so much that can be done. So let, let me just say thank you to all of our wonderful speakers here today. You've each had great messages about this topic, and it really is so important in this election year that we focus on getting as much participation as we can. Uh, and as Valencia said, part of the larger uh, voting rights um, fight is the voting, voting rights for people uh, among our younger population. And so thanks to all of you for the work you do and for taking some time to uh, have this Campaign Legal Center conversation with us today. We really, really appreciate it. And thanks to all of you for tuning in. Take care.